I think the, the the future very much is interdisciplinary, especially if you're thinking about climate change. It impacts everything and it impacts everyone. And to assume that we in a privileged part of the Western world are somehow isolated from many of these problems or that we have nothing to learn from what the rest of the world is doing is a huge fallacy. Welcome to Maths on the Move, the podcast from plus.maths.org. I'm Marianne Freiberger, and the person you just heard was Helena Stage from the University of Bristol. Helena talked to us about climate change, and in particular, she talked to us about what's perhaps a surprising aspect of climate change, namely the way it impacts on the spread of infectious diseases. This topic was discussed in January this year at a workshop at the University of Oxford, that brought together policymakers, climate scientists, epidemiologists and mathematicians. The workshop was funded by our colleagues at the Juniper Research Network and by the Isaac Newton Institute of Mathematical Sciences in Cambridge. Helena was one of the organizers of this workshop and in this episode of Maths on the Move, Helena speaks to my colleague Rachel Thomas about how exactly climate change might impact the spread of diseases, how mathematics can help in all of this and why it's so important to think globally. Here's Helena. So it can impact almost any infectious disease, be that in plants or animals, both domesticated and in wildlife, and of course in humans. And the effect of climate change of each of those categories of infection will of course differ. In general, what we are most preoccupied with are the diseases that already pose a significant risk in certain areas where climate change is then expanding the geographical range over which that pathogen can now spread. And so one example of that is if we think of vector-borne uh, disease, like if you're bitten by a tick or a mosquito, the diseases they can carry will affect more people if the areas in which those vectors can survive is now bigger. So we are increasingly seeing diseases that we used to think of as happening in the tropics, like uh, dengue or West Nile virus, going further and further into temperate climates, for example. But it's it's not limited to vectors and it's not limited to diseases that impact humans. So when you're talking about vectors, you're talking about things that carry or transmit a disease like mosquitoes. And so yes. that's why if mosquitoes can survive in areas they couldn't survive before, they could be increasing the spread of those diseases. Absolutely, yes. And are there other aspects? Um, when we were at the workshop, I was quite surprised by the different ways climate change could affect. So I had thought about it in terms of maybe an example, like you said, that animals might survive in areas. So I was thinking as things get warmer and it becomes easier for say mosquitoes to survive or some other vectors that spread disease to survive but there were other examples like if there was drought then the way people respond to drought also creates problems absolutely it's a it's a multi-layer problem and the ecological impact which is what i mentioned before in terms of just the suitability of vectors is just one of those there's our behavior, be that just in us not being aware of changing ecology and not responding appropriately, or us importing vectors into areas when we travel, we bring we bring diseases back if we got bitten somewhere else. And so if there's a if there are vectors that can carry a disease locally but that aren't at the time, infected with that if you come back from holiday and you are infected it could be that by you then being bitten you could 
then have local transmission. So there's just what we do as humans moving around. And then there's, of course, our behavior in, when it comes to things like water storage. So water storage very, very much depends on the vector. But for many mosquitoes in particular, having stagnant water is an invitation, if you will, for breeding grounds of uh, various different vectors. And in particular, there are some mosquitoes that preferentially bite humans. And so when we think about the, it being very hot, we might immediately think, oh, it's too warm for the mosquito to survive. But if we have vectors that have adapted to existing in, a, in an area where there are humans or in an area that has a high population density, that doesn't actually matter because as humans, we will still seek out the water for our own purposes. And in having that collection, we'll also create an environment that's going to be suitable for the breeding of more mosquitoes. So there were these interesting examples of climate change increasing drought and so people store water uncovered and that's what you're talking about that then those those water collections uh, are, are allowing mosquitoes to breed even though it's probably otherwise not so ho hospitable to them yes and it's it's not just someone in a drought necessarily collecting large amounts of water for the purposes of running a household or feeding themselves or cooking, what have you. It, it is also something as simple as if you have a garden with a pond, or if you have lots of plant pots that you leave out in a rainy season that then collect water, it doesn't need to be intentional water storage. That problem is just exacerbated through drought. I grew up in Australia and we had uh, exactly that, that we every, every, summer you'd get this um public education campaign that you had to make sure that you didn't have water store water gathering in pots and ponds with which because we had such bad mosquito problems otherwise so yeah it is interesting so it's so it's very much about the climate change and the effect on the environment but also human behavior and and the way humans are moving generally but also adapting to changes in climate absolutely and how does mathematics help in, we have a bit of a sense of through epidemiology and disease modeling, how it can help understand uh, the spread of disease, how to understand the spread of diseases, but how can maths help in doing that and also bringing in these climate change um, ideas? So maths helps at every single part of that layered problem. It helps on the ecological layer in thinking about how many more vectors will you have just by modeling the optimal temperature ranges and the abundance that you might expect to see. For example, if you have a really hot spring, you might expect more mosquitoes to hatch and that will then inform how many more possible vectors you have that could transmit an infection. It helps obviously on the climate side in trying to make long-term forecasts of, or scenarios of extreme weather. Will we have more drought? Will we have more rain? Will we have more flooding? That's a very, very complicated chaotic system when we think about climate modeling, but, but that also comes into it. And then increasingly, we are incorporating human infrastructure into our modeling of disease transmission. And that can be from trying to account for importations of disease. This was something that we started being really aware of, especially with COVID and new variants, how quickly those would spread and how that was related to human travel behavior. But it also is something that happens locally when we think about urban heat islands. So areas that are very population dense are often covered and built with materials that retain heat for much longer than if you have a grassy green area. And as a result, you might have a city that will be much, much hotter than its surroundings. And so even though the surroundings are maybe too cold still in the winter for a vector to survive, the city itself will remain hot enough. So the fact that we congregate and the 
places that we congregate in will in inherently create these little pockets of, of suitability, which is something to bear in mind when we think about urban planning and sustainability. And then of course, there's how we model human information campaigns. So you talk about the public information campaigns that happened uh, growing up with making sure your plot pots were turned over. But there's, there's, there's a lot um, that we're increasingly trying to account for in models of how can people best be reached? Are there certain demographics that need to be targeted more because they are possibly at greater risk? And so we can do statistical analyses of the intersection of socioeconomic backgrounds and household size and just local geography to really target areas where those campaigns are most necessary and also where they can have the biggest impact because of course all campaigns and all interventions are costly so behavior really is something that we're increasingly trying to push into those models as well it's so interesting there's so many different aspects to this and so many and as you said, maths is involved in all the layers. I mean, how do you bring all of those different layers together and, and allow the maths to communicate with the other bits of maths? Is that part of the reason why you organised the workshop that you did? Yes. I mean, we generally refer to it as multi-layer modelling, multi-scale modelling as well, if we think about different geographical scales. But no person can do everything that I just mentioned, right? Even just being a climate scientist, you may be specialised in one aspect of uh, the problem of how much rain will we have in the next 20 to 50 years. Uh, so the idea behind the, the, the workshop was very much let's bring in the specialist in modeling climate science, the people who have looked at behavior and adaptability in areas that are currently very experiencing large outbreaks of, um, let's say, vector borne disease annually, areas where that are seeing an increase because of this ecological invasion causing more and more problems, um, policymakers who are trying to figure out what they should be prioritizing and how to best think about these questions in terms of interventions and do we need more data. Uh, so, so really bringing everyone together and have a shared language and a shared understanding because we all very much agree that there is a problem, but the the key challenge is determining what the gaps are and how we can best collaborate to meet those challenges that we have coming. And what what did you what did you find from your experience of running the workshop and how that all those different groups, policymakers, the different expertise in different areas of modeling, um, how did you find that came together and sort of what things do you hope might happen next? So we we have we've had discussions about collaborations on a few different projects that could come out of it, which of course is wonderful. Uh, that's on a smaller scale with very specific problems. On, um, on a broader scale, there are continuing conversations about specifically what we might do in the UK, working with the UKHSA and other policymakers to really think about what the prioritization should be, who do we need to bring in still to work on these problems and... Um, so you can't have everyone in one meeting, of course. So can we bring in more entomologists for a follow-up meeting? Do we uh, need to involve more health economists? And so it was a really, really great starting point in having all of us agree on what the scientific problem is. And we're now shifting gears into framing that into the best policy and intervention outlook. And for you personally, with your research, I know we were lucky enough to talk with you previously about your work modelling um, diseases spread by mosquitoes and how that's starting to appear in areas of Europe and things. For you personally and your research, what were your highlights from the meeting and what are you hoping to take forward from here? Well, I have a few new collaborations, which is always wonderful. Um, 
the the main thing that really stood out was learning more about how human behavior really transcends so many other things in modeling the 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 effect of of any climate sensitive infectious disease so there were a number of talks that looked at disease impact burden and outcomes in east asia where what they found ultimately was that one of the biggest factors in determining long-term improvement in health not just in the short but sustainable long-term improvement was sanitation for one but secondly just people being aware people having that ability to protect themselves knowing that there is that challenge and so i'm even more conscious than i previously was of the importance of really incorporating that behavioral component i thought that was so interesting some of the examples from southeast asia that one of the biggest impacts you could have one of the biggest influences on the spread of disease was like proximity to piped water systems because then they were not collecting water I just as you said you just I I had no idea of the impact of this human behavior and policy on on these things yes it's it's one of those things that's so obvious once you think about it but if you're in a in a framework of primarily looking at it. So my perspective is, my, and my background is in ecological invasion and movement and, and transport and human movement. So to my mind, it, I was very much in a frame of, well, let's think about this as an invasion problem, how human movement is exacerbating and accelerating this. What are the important timescales in this problem, which is all very true, but it's also a framework that has a temperate climate as a status quo. And so it was really wonderful to have that step back and to compare and contrast the experiences. And we need many, many more experiences, especially from researchers in the global South. Uh, but there's also so, only so many people you can invite to a workshop, right? But, but really being able to take that step back and seeing what is happening elsewhere, where well, they already have this problem, but it's just getting worse. And really thinking about how much of this applies globally, how much of this applies to a context where it's just a, a question of management, but on a different scale, and what lessons can be exchanged in both directions. It's so, I mean, it, one of the reasons it was so interesting was this diverse group of people that you brought together from like policymakers and different areas of research and, and, and tackling different problems in different parts of the world. Is that is that a key part of the way that you work? Is that is that an exciting thing to you, this interdisciplinary and interregional kind of work? I think the, the the future very much is interdisciplinary, especially if you're thinking about climate change. It impacts everything and it impacts everyone. And to assume that we in a privileged part of the Western world are somehow isolated from many of these problems or that we have nothing to learn from what the rest of the world is doing is a huge fallacy. Um, we need to do more. We need to listen more. We need to provide more support as well. It's it's the same question that's been also brought up during COVID with vaccine equity, right? If we provide vaccination, if we provide support, we in turn will have fewer issues with variants. And it's so it's the question of what we do with climate sensitive infectious disease is not just what is our problem locally. It's how can we work collaboratively globally because it is all connected and we will see these problems. The question is just when are they arriving on our doorstep, not if. That was Helena Stage telling my colleague Rachel Thomas about the importance of bringing together different groups of researchers from all over the world to understanding both climate change and the spread of diseases and how one impacts the other. You can find out more about climate change and about epidemiology by going to plus.maths.org and entering those terms into the search box. We've also put links to some useful further information into the show notes. That's it for this episode of Maths on the Move. Thanks for listening and bye-bye.